Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us. If it's your first time or rejoining us, if you just took a little break from the winter series, we're excited to be back here for the spring horse grazing management series with NDSU Extension. Uh, my name is Mary Kina. I'm the Livestock Environmental Management Specialist at the Carrington Research Extension Center. And you'll be hearing from me uh, next week and in a couple weeks. Um, so today we have with us Kevin Sedvik, who is our range specialist for NDSU Extension. He's also the director of the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. Uh, so Kevin's going to go over horse grazing management with us today. We also have uh, Rachel Wald. She's our Ag and Natural Resource Extension Agent in McHenry County and Paige Brummond, who is our Ag and Natural Resource Extension Agent in Ward County. And so those two are gonna supplement some of the things that Kevin's talking about uh, with some more boots on the ground kind of action that you can take. And with that, we will get rolling. I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin and, and we'll go ahead. Well, thank you, Mary. And it's, it is nice to be back on this equine series. Um, it's been a, I wanna say it's been a nice day here at Central Grasslands, which we're near Streeter, North Dakota because we had a quarter inch of rain this morning. And so that in itself is a celebration of the day. So um, we're gonna talk about grazing management as it relates to horses. And the truth is, it doesn't matter what species you're grazing, grazing management is, a, is an encompassing concept that fits whether it's horses or cattle or sheep or, or whatever for animals. The, the difference is, you know, horses tend to graze a little bit differently, um, but we'll kind of cover some concepts here and, and we'll get into um, some different topic areas as well. Some of the topics we've covered today is obviously a little bit on grazing management, but we'll also cover um, some of the key species that you may find um, on your on your pastures. And you know, when it comes to horses, we almost typically see common types of grasses in these horse pastures. And so we'll talk about some of those grasses to give you a feel for nutritional quality, um, palatability, and, and how they may fit into your grazing program. Then we're going to hit some topics on management that relates to fertilizing. We'll hit some of the to toxic plants. Um, just so you get a feel for if you have these in your areas to look for and what to do in case you do have them. If you're looking to seed down a pasture, we'll talk about some seed mixes where you can get that seed from. And then we'll end, end on, on this side of the story on, um, on, on, on that, that, how to manage those grasslands once you seed them. All right, so let's talk about, about types of grasses next. And we'll end with, we'll, we'll kind of cover these we talked about a little bit ago on fertilizing potential toxic plants and where to plant these grasses. Next, Rachel. So I'm gonna start with probably the most common grass that we see in a lot of our pastures in North Dakota, especially horse pastures is, is smooth brome grass. Um, some of you may actually have meadow brome grass in your mixes. Um, the brome grasses are my favorite mixes to put in for, for horses because horses really like brome grass. It stays palatable for them much of the season. It's high quality. And it's a nice grass that you can use whether you're grazing geldings, mares, even, even mares with foals on their side. And so it's commonly you'll see in these pastures. It's also a common grass that we'll see in our ditches. So if you're putting up, up ditch haze, this also fits very well. Next. And this just shows you a picture of, of a mature brome grass to your right. And so may, those of you who will see these blowing in, in the wind, in the ditches or in your pastures, it's a, it's a very broad headed plant. Um, when it gets to this phase, it tends to be a little less, less palatable and lower in quality. And so if you are putting up hay at these stages, um, especially if you have a lactating mare or you have some show horses that you're actually using quite a bit, um, you may need to be, supplement some protein with these feeds. Next. The other one we see common throughout North Dakota is Kentucky bluegrass. This is true whether you're in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, um, whether it was planted in a mix or it's invaded your brome grass fields. Um, it's now become common in most of our pastures. It's a much lower growing plant, um, but it is very palatable. Horses really do like bluegrass, especially when it's green and lush and in the immature stage. It's, it, in the ecology business, we, we tend to look at this grass as an, as an invader because it tends to invade our native prairies. But in terms of horses, this is a really good feed for horses. Um, like brome grass, when it becomes mature, it becomes a little less palatable and also loses the quality. And so protein tends to be an issue when this grass starts to mature out. Next. And the third one I'm gonna talk about is Crested Wheatgrass. And this is more of a grass we see in the Western Dakotas, Eastern Montana, Eastern Wyoming, um, very common in horse pastures. And what I call West River, um, it, it does well in the drier climates. So if you're in an, a precip zone of 14 inches or less, we tend to go with the Crested over the Bromes. Uh, horses do like it. 
when it's in the immature stage. They do not like it when it's in the stage we see in this picture here, it starts to head out. And so in, in this phase, we tend to see a lot of it put up for hay versus grazing, and it almost, almost always is used in cattle feed. And so we call it a wolf plant at this stage, and it's just because it has a poor palatability for horses. Next. And so the last one I have here is, is quack grass. And I, I did lump um, intermediate wheat grass in this mix. So we'll call them the wheat grasses. On the average, horses um, like wheat grass, but they don't really you know, prefer it over a brome grass or over a bluegrass. Most of our wheat grasses are typically seen in hay mixes. Um, especially if you do a CRP mix or you're doing a, a CD mix for horses, you'll see the intermediate wheat grass and slender wheat grass put in this mix. Um, where you have invaded pastures, if you have a brome grass field or a bluegrass field that's a little bit salty, they tend to get invaded with quack grass, which I have in this picture here is quack grass. Horses absolutely love quack grass in this phase, and it's a very good high quality feed. And um, once it matures out, it tends to become less palatable and you'll get, you'll get some issues in the next slide, uh, Rachel. You'll see the picture here um, of quack where it can get a little bit coarse. So the last one we really have, and, and you'll see this more in, in the, the western half of the Dakotas, is native pasture. When we get east, most of our pastures have been seeded for horses. So if you're in eastern Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, um, you almost always will see a seeded pasture. In the western part of the state, so we'll see native pasture used for horses. It's a very good, high quality feed. It provides year round grazing because of the mixes of species in a native grass mix. And they're also very palatable. They tend to be a little bit lower in production um, compared to what I call an, an introduced or a improved species like a meadow brome or an intermediate wheatgrass. Um, but they tend to retain quality better later in the season. And you can put these in about any different soil type and get your mixes to fit very well. Next slide, please. The nice thing about native range is it is actually the most aesthetic, aesthetic value. Whenever you see the pictures of horses, um, you're riding a horse across rangelands, it's always a, a very scenic area. And I know one of our speakers today, Paige, has some beautiful country up north of Minot where she gets a chance to ride and she's actually on rangeland. So it gives you this aesthetic value that you can use to enjoy your horse on rangelands besides just a feed base. So next. So one of the management scenarios you can do to improve the tonnage of your forages on those pastures um, is fertilizing. And so whether you have a crested or a brome field or even an orchard grass field, if you're calling from Iowa and you got a Timothy field, they will always be deficient of fertility once they get to be about three to five years of age. And so we highly recommend fertilizing these stands to one, keep them healthy and vigorous, but two, also increase the tonnage on these stands. This is a picture of a, of a typical bluegrass stand that's fertilized in the top, unfertilized in the bottom. And you can see there's quite a difference in terms of not only greenness, but you'll see a difference in color. You'll also see a difference in, in quality. When you fertilize these fields, they tend to be higher in quality as well. Next slide. And so this is actually a brome grass field uh, taken in South Dakota. You can see the strips, this test strip on the right is fertilized. The control is not fertilized. So you can see how it grows much more aggressively after a fertilizer program. You get a greener color. Um, and so on the average, we tend to produce about 50% more biomass uh, when you fertilize versus not fertilize. And if you haven't fertilized in, in over five years or more, you can tend to double your production by the second year of fertilizing. So it's just a great practice to increase your, your quality and tonnage on that hay field or on that grazing field. Next. So when we look at fertilizing, these are some examples where I'd put fertilizer down. It's brome, crested wheatgrass, intermediate wheatgrass, timothy, orchard grass. Any pasture that's been seeded will not have that, that symbiotic relationship, as we say, with the soil microbes and, and lack what's called a fast nutrient soul, uh, flow. Do not fertilize native pastures. Native pastures do not become um, deficient of nitrogen because of the microbial population within native pastures. If you fertilize native pastures, they will change and shift to mainly in our country a bluegrass pasture. So only on these improved pastures. Uh, so, you can, and so you can see where the benefit will be in terms of production and quality. Next. So what, what to fertilize with? And you can go next, Rachel. So the, the most common fertilizer we'll use is nitrogen. Um, if you go to a salesperson and, they, and you tell me you wanna buy fertilizer for your pasture, they're gonna try and sell you nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The only one that actually adds tonnage or production is nitrogen. 
And so it is the only one that I ever recommend on domestic pastures. Um, you could add some P and K. You won't be able to pay for it in terms of tonnage, but you might pay for it in terms of, of different mineral contents within the grasses. But for me, nitrogen is your limiting factor. In the Western half of the Dakotas, even in the Montana, Wyoming, we do about 40 to 60 pounds per acre of actual nitrogen. And after you do it back to back years, we do it every other year. In the Eastern Dakotas and in the Minnesota and Iowa, uh, we go about 60 to 80 pounds of nitrogen. That's actual nitrogen um, every for the first two years. And once you get into a program, it's every other year. Next. And so when do you fertilize? We're really reaching probably what I call the end time of fertilizing uh, in the Northern Plains. So late April to mid-May is preferred. And, and if, you give, if I gave you the option, I would tell you to fertilize as early as possible. Um, so you can do it during cooler climates and when the moisture is there to give you that benefit. The most common fertilizer we use is urea. It is straight nitrogen. So it's 46% uh, nitrogen. So hundred pounds of urea will have 46 pounds of nitrogen. Um, and we typically will top dress this on a pasture. So the picture you'll see to your right just shows you a, a, a spreader, a spreading fertilizer. And you can see the white little um, uh, molecule uh, or parts of that fertilizer on the ground. And these need about a quarter inch of moisture to get them to dissolve and put into the soil. Um, once they're in the soil, you start to see the activity from, from that benefit. Next. Um, and it is important to talk about the, the timing. So if you do fertilize now, let's say we get into mid-May and you're gonna fertilize and it's above 70 degrees, it will volatilize out. So you wanna reduce that impact of volatilization. So try and do it when it's cooler climates. Thanks, next. So let's talk about weeds. And, and I, it's rarely I get a chance to go into a horse pasture where there's not some weeds in those pastures. And so uh, one of the more common ones you'll see throughout the Dakotas, the Minnesota, is horse weed. And this is an annual weed that we'll see. And annuals tend to be a problem when you overgraze your pastures. Next. This is a common, I, don't, I didn't give you the flower here, but this is dandelion. Uh, we see dandelion common in a lot of our horse pastures. Uh, especially in the eastern half of the Dakotas and the Minnesota. Um, on the average, I don't worry about it till it becomes a, a, a visually, you know, a quarter, quarter of the stand. And then I'm gonna look at a herbicide treatment to control the dandelions. Next. So this is a, a very young Canada thistle and I'll give the next picture to Rachel. Um, Canada thistle is common in a lot of our horse pastures. Another one you'll see is absent wormwood. Whenever you see noxious weeds like these coming in, that tells me that the pasture's probably been a history of overgrazing. So that niche is now there in the soil profile uh, to capture those seeds and to get some invasion from these weeds. Next, I'm gonna talk about toxic weeds and I'm gonna focus primarily on the trees today. Uh, next. And so and I did a story on toxic toxicity in horses on, tree, on trees about three months ago. And probably the most common one we see are the maple trees whether it's a box elder tree, an actual maple, the leaves are toxic to horses. Um, they have to consume a, a, a fair amount of it to, to have issues, but it takes about a three pounds of ingestion per thousand pounds of weight can be deadly in horses. So if you do have trees that border your fences or border your pastures, um, it's something you need to think about when these trees start to, when these leaves start to fall off the leaves, or if you're getting too many in there and other horses consuming it. On the average, they will not eat many leaves if there's plenty of grass in those pastures. Um, you tend to see severe anemia, depression, and increased breathing with maple toxicity. I, in my career, I've seen two of this happen where the horses actually died from maple tree toxicity. Next slide. And so another one we'll see, especially if you have uh, trees within your area, like a tree grove, is choke cherries. Um, we all like to, to go get choke cherries and make some choke cherry jam but choke cherries can be very toxic to horses in class. In fact, they're toxic to almost all classes of livestock, especially when the leaves are stressed or wilted. Uh, the bark can be somewhat toxic, but it's primarily the leaves. And what you have here is cyanide toxicity, which is very deadly to any uh, animal as well as humans. Next slide. So this is just a picture of the flowers of choke cherry. Next. And then some of the symptoms you'll look at uh, with death for death usually occurs is flared nostrils. So you'll see them, they'll be breathing hard. Um, almost like if, if you're familiar with um, heaves and horses, you'll see similar, that flaring of the nostrils 
uh, with choke cherry toxicity. So they're, they're labored and breathing, lack of coordination, and then trembling and agitation. <clears throat> so it's just something to look for. You need to get them off these if these are problems. Other toxic plants that we'll see that are not palatable to horses, but you, you, you'll hear instances where horses become sick from these plants. So horsetail, uh, Rachel will show horsetail first. Um, and, then, and then we'll look at probably one that gets the most talk about is loco weed. Next. Oh, there's no pictures. <laughs> um, so um, loco weed is one that uh, get, it, it's, a, it's one of the broad leaves that horses tend to, you have individuals that will pick it out and they call it loco weed because it affects the nerve system that's attached to their eyes. And so everything looks big to them. So they tend to tend to run around and they look like they're going to local. So that's a common one you will see. Uh, milkweeds are very common in, in the Northern Plains and you'll see horses pick on the leaves on this one, but normally they won't eat it. If you're in the Western Dakotas, uh, even in the Minnesota we have oak trees, uh, both the acorns and the leaves can be toxic late in the season. If the grass is not short, you typically will not have a problem. And then poison hemlock and ragworts um, are also can be common, very deadly, but oftentimes you rarely ever consumed. Next. And so we also have nitrate accumulators. And these are basically plants that have nitrates in them that if horses consume it, um, can have an, an effect on nitrate toxicity levels. Horses tend to not die from nitrate toxicity, but they'll run a very high fever. And then you gotta, gotta get a hold of the vet and take care of that situation before they do die. I, I've, I've seen nitrate toxicity in horses a couple times. They almost always run a high fever. Um, death can follow, but it is pretty rare. And so common plants uh, that you'll see is kochia, Russian thistle, and lamb's quarter. These are common in pastures that tend to be overgrazed. And you can see the story I'm coming with here. Keep your pastures healthy, and usually annuals and toxic plants are not an issue. If you start to get areas of overgrazing, these annuals will come in, and then you have the issues. Next. And so the, the last thing I want to talk about, and obviously we'll be here for questions, but is you're looking to seed a new pasture, or let's say you have a pasture that's, that's got some bare ground in it and you want to overseed that pasture, um, there are some options you can look at. Where do you get seed? You know, for me, in, the, in North Dakota in particular, I usually call my local dealer. I'll call into the local town if I'm living near New Rockford, I'll call my, my dealer in New Rockford, or I could call anywhere you want that sells seed and they'll find most of these seeds for you. There's also larger seed companies in, in, the, in the Dakotas. South Dakota, my example here is just Agassi Seed, but there's a number of, of companies that have access to buy seed. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about uh, what I call are my favorite mixes for horses. Um, probably my, my favorite grass, especially in North Dakota, is, is meadow brome grass. And especially meadow brome with a little bit of alfalfa on that stand, which then keeps the nitrogen flowing in that plant, is a very nice quality feed for horses, whether you graze it or hay it. As we get into the south part of the state, into Minnesota, you'll see orchard grass also commonly used. Um, I don't recommend orchard grass in most North Dakota because it winter kills out. But if you're in South Dakota or Minnesota, especially in Southern half, orchard grass can replace meadow brome. The beauty of both those species is they regrow really well. So in, in a grazing system where you rotate, you can get good grazing use, get regrowth, and come back and graze that plant. My second choice is the intermediate wheat grasses or pubescent wheat grass mixes. They're not quite as palatable as the meadow brome, but they do very well in our climate, even in our drier climates. Um, and they've put up right, when you get to that boot stage, they also make really good hay. The trick is you gotta get it up before you go to seed or the quality or the palatability really drops. And that's true if you're grazing it as well. And the last one, if you're in the Western Dakotas and into Montana, you know, a Crestia wheatgrass alfalfa mix is a really good option for horses. And I do like alfalfa because for, for the most part, horses don't bloat, but if you had about 10 to 20% of the stand alfalfa, um, and, and like any of the other animals, they almost always pick the grass over the alfalfa when they're grazing. It gives you a way to keep nitrogen flowing in that system. And so it's a nice mix for horses. Next. And so the best time to seed these, these mixes is, is right now. If you need to do any kind of seeding, um, early April to late May is that window of opportunity. I like to put my, my seed in by right about now or end of April, early May. Um, I know this year has been pretty dry, so timing will be more critical on hitting the rains when you put it in. Um, so you can time that with the, with the future rain events to do that. The second best time period is a dormant seeding, or we call it dormant seeding, and that's mid-October to early November. You basically want to seed it, 
but you don't want it to germinate in the fall. And you want it to germinate the following spring. That's why it's called a dormant seeding. These are very successful and, and almost as good as the, as the spring seedings. Um, it's just a matter of when you can get it in. Next. And so um, let's talk about this overseeding. And, and we, I, even I've done this in my pastures is I've overseeded when I get my, my, my pastures are about 25 years of age. So I'm seeing some age issue with my grasses. And so I'll actually go in there on the bare spots and, and broadcast it in, and then I'll drag it in. Um, if you get drilled in, it's even better. Um, but it, it's an option you can do to kind of get more production out of it. If overgrazing is your primary reason, you're going to have to still drop back on that grazing pressure, especially if you want to seed it and get some growth before those before you put the horses in. And we typically need about, you know, I would say about four months of growth for that grass growth for that grass to get enough root structure so it can withstand the grazing pressure. And, and depending on your pastures, I like to seed a like species. So if you have a brome grass field, seed with brome. If you have a crested field, seed with crested. You don't want to seed a brome in a crested because the horses are going to always pick the brome and the crested will get wolfy on you. So drill, so seed what's in that mix. And the preferred technique is drilling it in versus broadcasting. If you do have access to broadcast and you can drag it in, that is another option, especially when it comes to overseeding. Next slide. Um, that's the end of my talk. And so I think, I think we're going to turn it over to, I believe it's not sure if it's Rachel or Paige, but I'll be on for the rest of the, of, of the session and we can take any questions at the end. Thanks, Kevin. Um, a lot of what Kevin talked about actually coincides with grazing strategies and grazing ideas. Um, so with the season that we have this year, we're actually not, um, you know, we're looking more into the, the limiting term out time or rotational grazing instead of continuous grazing because of the fact that we're so short on moisture that that the the ability of those blocks or those pastures to come back after after some pretty hard continuous grazing is going to be a lot harder because we don't have the moisture to bring back those grasses. Um, we also notice uh, just a slight discussion on this because we're going to talk about drought next week, but we did also notice that there are some delay in these grasses as well. Um, so we really want to watch that before we turn out to pasture. And again, we'll we'll talk more on that next week. But this is a good um, picture to show so that you, you know you have a sacrifice area with water or shelter, um, a place that you can feed um, your grains or supplements or dry hay, um, and then hopefully be able to rotate them through the pastures so that you can't, uh, you're able to keep pressure off of one area more than the other. Um, so this is just kind of a good idea for grazing strategy. So again, that rotational grazing, meaning um, that you'll go from pasture one to pasture two, to pasture three, to pasture four throughout the season, or limiting turnout time um, to your critters, maybe uh, keeping them in at night after they've, they've had a, a little bit of supplemental grain or or possibly a little bit extra hay to make sure that they're not putting too much pressure on the, that pasture. So with the rotational grazing, uh, you wanna take into thought the number of paddocks that you have available to you um, and how many days with how many horses you're going to be putting in there. So those are some things I we really want you to look at, especially with um, the situation that we're in this year, grass is gonna be a hot commodity this year. So if you're able, or you have any, or you're able to graze, um, this is one thing to really watch to make sure that you do not overgraze those, those paddocks or, or different locks that you have set up for your horses. This is just kind of a rule of thumb. So if you have two paddocks um, and in the spring, you turn out to one that's, that's appropriately, um, the appropriate height for grazing, then you're, you're looking at maybe 14 days of grazing with 14 days of rest. So, and then it changes throughout the summer because in the spring, you're gonna have your cool season grasses that are, that are coming up and that's what your horses are gonna graze on. In the summer, you're getting your warm seasons or your later spring, a year later cool into your warm season grasses. And then in the fall, it is your warm season grasses. To, so making sure that these are able to come back for fall grazing or you know, keeping that pasture available so that fall grazing is a possibility for you. So it all just depends on how many, how many pastures you have available, how many horses are going to be going into that. So this is all part of what 
what you'll need to watch for rotational grazing this summer. I'm gonna just lightly touch on some of the weed management for pastures. Uh, Kevin did talk about you know, how a lot, of, a lot of pastures that are overgrazed, you're gonna see more weeds in them. And this is, this is something that, that is, really needs to be watched as well. It's, it's weed management is basically whole pasture management. Um, so starting with whole pasture management is going to help with any weeds that you get. Um, and then there's, there's several ways to control them. The three main ways that we're gonna talk about is, is cultural, chemical, or mechanical. Um, so there's not, not a ton of cultural methods, but um, chemical or spraying is, is one of them. And then mechanical um, is the other. So mowing them down instead of spraying them could be an option for you, especially if you have smaller pastures or maybe don't wanna spray um, because you're not able to, if they're, the horses are in there, we don't recommend spraying while any animals are in there. Um, and then also following the label on any chemical that you utilize. Um, the first thing you wanna do to make sure that you get uh, proper control of any weeds is to ID those weeds. So knowing what you're, you're up against, knowing what you're handling is going to help and go a long way when you're talking about possibly either chemical control or mechanical control, because then you know, you know when the best time to mow is, when the seed head comes, um, when the best time to spray is and when you're going to get the best control for it. So those are the things that we really want, um, want to look at because when you have kind of an overall control or overall um, management of your pasture, your grass is going to grow well enough to outcompete those weeds. So making sure that you're taking care of the weeds that you have so that your grass can, you know, help you with the control of those weeds in the future. So making sure, you know, weed management starts with pasture management. And then Kevin also talked about uh, fertilizing your pastures. We did want to mention a little bit, there is a possibility of, you know, you can do some soil testing on that pasture to see how much nitrogen you may want to put down. Um, and then he also mentioned, you know, you don't usually want to put down any phosphorus or potassium but when you're doing soil testing we then can see how much is there uh, which is good like he said for the nutrients in the plant or the the minerals in the plant so that's good to know as well um ph and organic matter is also good to know especially if you're needing to overseed on anything you're able to know kind of what seeds would be able to be put down um, with the ph levels that you have there Usually when you soil test, you go to a depth of six inches um, and you don't wanna just test in one spot. You wanna, you wanna test the whole field and you can collect samples kind of in a zigzag pattern using a spade um, and adding you know, six inches of dirt into, the bu into a bucket, mixing it all up and then putting it into a bag um, like there is on the right hand side. I do have one right here too. Um, and we do send that off to the NDSU soils lab. So that's, that's normally what you get back is the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, pH, and organic matter. Um, usually you can, can do soil testing about every three years. So it's not an every year sort of thing. Um, and Kevin had mentioned too, you know, you're not going to fertilize every year. Once you get into it, it's going to be either every other year or every two years or every, every third year. Sorry. Um, so you just want to make sure that that's kind of kind of how you're going. If you do have um, different areas of a pasture, so a high area and maybe a low area, I would suggest soil sampling those separately. So your low area and your high area would be two different samples. So you'd end up putting in um, two different areas so that you know you know kind of what's going into both of those. And next, I'm going to actually turn it over to Paige. All right, so let's talk about when to initiate and cease grazing. A lot of people decide when to turn out just based on the calendar, and that's not the best method as it's going to vary year to year depending upon the weather conditions and then also what part of the state you're at and what species you have in your pasture. One of the recommended ways to determine when to start grazing is by leaf growth stage. It's the most accurate for most of our species. Um, and, and the majority of them, you know, as a general rule of thumb, we're going to say three to three and a half leaf stages when you want to start. So this picture on the left, we have one full leaf, two full leaf, 
three full leaves. So this picture on the left is a three leaf stage. The one on the right is at three and a half leaves, three full leaves. And then this uh, fourth one is just about halfway um, out. So that would be the recommendation that you can use in your own pastures. Some people really like to go by height of the pasture as well, and that doesn't consider species differences. So there are some recommendations that you'll find out there from different um, universities and grazing management publications that'll say, you know, start when grazing when the grass is six to eight inches tall. If you're in an area where you have a majority of grass species in your pasture that don't ever get that tall, even in a high moisture year, that's not going to work for you. Um, so you really kind of need to know what, what species you're dealing with. But if you're going by the, the height method, and that's a lot of our cool season grasses that follow um, those recommendations in, in some publications, you want to stop when the majority of the grasses are about four inches tall. That's also an issue too when we hear people say take half and leave half. And that is a good recommendation, but we want to think of that by the volume of the plant or the weight of the plant and not just the height. Because again, some of our grass species don't get very tall but they may have a lot of leaves at the base of the plant. So the idea is, is that you're taking half of the plant and leaving half. We do have more information on that in another publication. Um, so the detriments of grazing too early is that you're gonna reduce plant vigor. It reduces the amount of plant leaf surface or leaf tissue area that's needed for photosynthesis and growth. So you're gonna end up with weaker plants, thinner stands, lower total forage production and increased risk of those disease pressures or weed pressure along with disease and, and potentially some insects. So that all comes back to what Rachel's talking about for grazing management. Um, grazing too early and overgrazing uh, result in these issues. And it can take several years to regain productivity. On the flip side of this, you can also graze too late. And Kevin mentioned, especially on plants that are unpalatable once they head out and reach maturity like crested wheatgrass, um, if you wait until uh, the plant is headed out, the horses aren't going to eat them and they're going to end up wasting that grass. So here's a visual for overgrazing. When we say take half and leave half, let's look at what that could mean. So if we remove 50% of the volume of the leaf, the percent of growth, growth stoppage is 2 to 4%, so just a small amount. But as we increase removing 70% of the volume of the leaves, you, re you stop or reduce that root growth by almost 80%. And if we remove 80% of the leaf volume, you completely stop root growth. Okay, so that's some of the uh, underground things. So sometimes we just look at what's growing above ground and what's happening with the forage production that way. But we have to keep in mind that the root growth is also very important for your plant vigor. Next thing we're going to talk about is transitioning your horses to spring grasses. We have an issue um, with some horses, and sometimes we forget that this can be an issue when they go from eating a dry forage that is maybe a little bit lower in non-structural carbohydrate production, and we suddenly turn them out onto a lush green grass pasture like we have in the picture here. That sudden change can cause hindgut disruption, meaning that Normally, the nutrients that are absorbed in the small intestine get bypassed into the cecum and can cause some issues in horses. Primarily, they'll start with symptoms that are similar to colic, maybe some diarrhea and gas. And if we don't manage that or back them off of this new change in diet and, and higher levels of our non-structural carbohydrates, it can continue to cause issues, to drop the pH and, and result in some laminitis problems. So the key thing to remember here is to adapt your horses to spring grass slowly. So say right now, if they're on a full hay diet in a dry lot while you're letting your pasture grow and reach the appropriate stage before you turn them out, when the grass is ready to graze, start by letting them graze that 15 to 30 minutes a day at a time and increase that each day until they're grazing and out on grass for more than four hours a day. At that time, you're usually safe to consider or safe to let them graze the entire time or stay out on pasture the entire time. That allows the uh, microbes to adapt. You want to monitor your horses closely. If they have any of the symptoms that we talked about, um, remove them from grass and certainly consult with your veterinarian if the symptoms are severe.
Here's a couple methods for managing higher risk horses. So our, our insulin resistant horses, horses that have been diagnosed with Cushing's or horses that are obese. You can use grazing muzzles, try to avoid grazing in sunny afternoons. You can consider turning them out just overnight after they've been adapted to that spring grass. Even um, at the lowest non-structural carbohydrate levels in the early morning hours can still exceed the recommended intake for some of these at-risk horses. So again, you wanna work with your veterinarian to come up with a, a good strategy um, and realize that all horses are at risk, but some of our horses are even more at risk. So that's all I have for you today. I'm gonna to go ahead and turn the floor back over to Mary and she's gonna um, finish out the webinar. Okay, so um, are there questions? This is the time when you guys can unmute and um, ask questions and we can actually, Rachel, if you wanna send it back to just the gallery view, then people can go ahead and unmute and ask some questions. We did have some stuff rolling through the chat. So while you're thinking of your question, um, Veronica had asked about uh, horses being treated after eating uh, red maple tree or other toxic plants. And Kevin just went ahead and answered that um, if, if that is a potential, to call your vet. Um, they can possibly treat with activated charcoal or mineral via stomach tube. Um, and so calling the vet in a case of emergency is always good. Other thoughts or questions? Okay, Mindy says, can we fertilize with manure that is one or two years old? Um, if so, when's the best time to do that? So I am going to see what Kevin has to say about this just from a grass standpoint, um, even though I'm the manure person. So I'm going to let Kevin um, take a shot at this and then I will follow up. Well, I'll say, you know, spreading manure on tame grass pastures is a, is a technique to add fertility. And, and Mary will tell the details on this, but it does add nitrogen into the profile as well as P and K. And so it is one of those that you can use and you can, you can really spread fertilizer any, any time, but the best time, and I'll let Mary cover that, is you do get a benefit from that manure. Now, Mary can tell you when and how much. So, um, yeah, we, we like to uh, soil sample um, to tell us the how much. And the when, I, I would just say, so Kevin had talked about, you know, using urea or using a, a nitrogen. Um, that's going to be really readily available. Um, manure is less readily available. It takes a little more time, especially a horse manure. Horse manure is very neutral um, in how the, the nutrients um, are mineralized. So it's not, so there's like a, a liquid manure would have more of the properties of uh, right now nitrogen, whereas horse manure, um, it just takes a little more time. And so that is, I, I wouldn't recommend it if you're going to say, we want to spread it right now and have beautiful green pastures. Um, probably going to go with Kevin's recommendations from earlier. But if you're thinking, I have all this manure and I want to spread it, I composted it, I want to spread it, I want to spread it raw, absolutely spread it. It is for fertility, just um, keeping in mind when you're going to do that. And so probably I would recommend doing it in the fall so it has time to mineralize. And then by spring, we should see some benefits from that. So a great question, Paul, up there. And I don't know the answer to this, but maybe Paige does. Obviously, horse manure can carry parasites. Um, is there a time period when, the, when you get less live parasites in terms of age of manure? Well, this one back at Mary, too, and making sure that if you're applying manure, that it's correctly composted and heated to the appropriate levels to interrupt the life cycle of those parasites. What was the follow-up question? I'm sorry. I don't know if you had any specifics on, um, you know, what temperature the pile needs to reach in order to make sure that we're killing those parasites through all of its life stages. Okay. Yep. So we want it between 130 and 150 um, is a really good, uh, good place to have that. So we're going to be killing weed seeds, pathogens, um, all of that stuff between those temperatures. We're still having some composting action happen under that 130. Um, I mean, if you stick your hand in there, you're like, wow, this is pretty warm. So there is some action happening. But if you want that actual pathogen and weed seed kill, uh, we're going to want to make sure that we um, are under the are between the 130 and 150. We don't necessarily want to go over that either, uh, because that's where we then kind of kill everything. We just kill the entire process. 
Uh, and so that's more of what happens in stockpiling. We have one really great heat cycle uh, and then it stops. So that is what I say there. And it looks like Brooks has a question. Are there any forages that are better for a horse um, that has foundered? From a grass standpoint, I think this is hard, uh, hard to manage um, because the, the nutritional values of grasses change so quickly throughout the grazing season that uh, I believe the recommendation for horses that have foundered or at high risk for foundering again is to manage their diet a little bit more closely with forages that have been tested. Um, so, you know, I would definitely work with the vet because it's going to depend on the risk level of that particular horse. You do see some horses that have just a mild risk of foundering or mild laminitic case that, you know, they can graze for a short period of time with a grazing muzzle and um, they're fulfilling their nutritional needs with a, a balanced dry forage on the other hours of the day. So it's gonna really be an individualized case. Uh, and if anybody's wondering why Rachel uh, is sharing this again, I just asked her to, this is a new uh, reporting that we have to do. And so if you wanna scan that QR code or I put the link in the chat, if you wanna do that, you're more than welcome to. Uh, just some demographics, age, uh, race, ethnicity questions. Um, are there other questions relating to, uh, and so um, manure management, we're going to go into just a little bit next week, we're going to touch on, and then we're going to have an entire hour of it uh, in two weeks. And so um, certainly if you have questions and you didn't put them in the registration when you registered, uh, you can register again and type it in, or you can just send it to me. Um, when I send you the, the link for where we're putting um, this recording, you can just send a, a question back if you have something specific you'd really like me to cover in the manure talk. And next week we're focusing on drought management, which is a very pertinent and timely topic for the entire state of North Dakota this year. Yes, and so that's where we'll learn more about um, feeding during the drought and grazing during the drought, uh, a little bit of dry lotting and manure management during drought. And so all things that you're wondering about. And again, if you have questions specific to that, that you may not have answered or asked, you can send those to me too. Okay. I think with that, uh, we will be done for the day. So thanks guys for participating and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.